Greetings, fellow humans, and welcome to the April 24th Brandon Lunch Bunch. We're a group of people, uh, professionals in the Brandon, Tampa, Florida area, uh, who are getting together during these COVID stay-at-home times and offering tips and tricks on how to do business in these stay-at-home times. My name's Dave Lobig. A little later, I'm going to have a tip on uh, when you're working at home, include to the screen, how to clear your mind a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to go around and introduce our panelists. Uh, first on my screen is Darren. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. I'm uh, happy to be part of the Brandon Lunch Bunch. And my name is Darren Dennington from Service with Style. I've been in the Brandon area for 22 years. And today I'm really excited to talk a little bit about your, your guest, your customer, and the, the three different avenues that you have to leave an impression on them, your service, your product, and your marketing. So thanks for having me today. Uh, David. Hi, everyone. I'm David Thornton with A Better Choice Network Solutions, your full-service IT company here in Brandon uh, with this focus on cybersecurity. Uh, after 26 years in law enforcement, I started my career, uh, my second career, uh, with this company about four and a half years ago. So that's me, David, at A Better Choice. Thank you. And Yobi? Good morning, everybody. I'm Joby Fermin, Realtor with Charles Rothenberg Realty. And this morning, I want to share some information or um, an, an article that uh, came in the uh, Florida Realtors magazine about COVID-19 and the Fair Housing Act and how it's affecting tenants currently. Thank you. And Larry? Yeah, that would be me. I do video stuff. And these days I am doing a lot less video production with clients like I normally do in Central Florida. And I'm doing a lot more virtual video coaching, just helping people be better on camera. And Danielle, finally. Good morning, everybody. Danielle Dryden with Dryden Tax Resolution. Uh, today, I'm going to give you some updates on the new legislation that passed yesterday afternoon regarding more PPP funds. Thank you. And first up, we're going to go to our segment. Uh, Larry's going to do something for us. All righty. So this, uh, over to you, Larry. Thank you. Okay. So one of the things that... Um, that people have been paying a lot of attention to. I just did a real quick tips video on how to be better on Zoom calls. And interestingly, USA Today picked that up and ran with it. So a whole lot of people have been very interested in those things. So I'll go through some of the things that I covered in that quick video, but I'll also go through some extra things, some add-ons. And let me start right at the top by saying, if you just go to youtube.com slash Larry Becker, You'll actually find my latest tips and tricks, actually all kinds of tips and tricks videos about being on camera and how to be better on camera and things like that. But the the recent ones from here in April uh, actually cover how to be better in a Zoom meeting. And so again, because of that, I've been doing more of these types of virtual meetings uh, with service clubs and things like that to help people be better on camera. So let's jump in and talk about a few things that you should and shouldn't do when you're trying to be on camera. One of the things that I would say try to get away from if you possibly can is the handheld vertical video shaky cam that so many people are comfortable doing. I mean, we're used to talking to our cell phone, our smartphone. And if you can actually put it on a mount, and then also if you can put it horizontally, you're going to get a better experience. You're going to be more watchable. And a big chunk of the things that I talk about here have to do with increasing your credibility, your likability, your believability, and help you be your best self when you're communicating on video. There are a lot of things that you don't even know are happening that are visual cues and audible cues to people that diminish your credibility. So I'm going to go through some of those, what they are and how to avoid them. Um, so the shaky cam is a bad thing. You want a good, stable image. Next up, look for something like um, a place that you can put your camera a little bit further away. Now, let me tell you what I mean by this. All the cameras that most of us use for these types of meetings, whether it's a, uh, a webcam 
or something built into the laptop or something built into the smartphone or your tablet. They all are wide angle lens cameras and they don't have zoom built into them for the most part. So that makes us all look our worst. It makes us look round. And when you get close, you look really round. And then when you put your camera in a bad spot, it looks really bad. So let me show you what that looks like. This is a still image from, it's just everything you can do wrong. The camera's too low, so you're looking up my nose. The lighting is bad, so it's all blown out on the side of my face. It's all extra over white. Then I've got shiny uh, skin on my forehead, and it's just all bad. I'm wearing a bad shirt because the shirt has patterns in it, and that doesn't look good on camera. Now, what you want to do then is change things. You want the camera to be eye level because when you can make direct eye contact at eye level with the group that you're talking to, you have to get used to how to do this on video. But when you can do that, it makes you look much better. It, it helps you connect better when you're communicating. Um, the next thing, and there's more to it on the camera than that, but the main thing is get it up to about eye level. If you have to put your laptop on a box, if you have to take your webcam and put it on top of your computer monitor, whatever it takes to get that camera eye level, that's going to be very helpful. Now, the next thing is lighting. A lot of us think, well, if I'm just in a really bright room, so I'm going to go in the kitchen and I'm going to do my video meeting from in the kitchen. The problem is that those bright lights are overhead. And so that makes your eye sockets potentially kind of dark. It makes your eyes look bad. What you really need is, regardless of the other light in the vicinity, whether you have a side light or an overhead light or a backlight, regardless of the other light in the scene, you want the brightest light to be really close to wherever your camera is. So I tell people, maybe go through the house, find a lamp, take the lamp shade off, and then put a light, a really bright light, really close to your camera so that wherever your camera is, right beside it is a bright light. And that bright light source comes straight at your face. And as long as that lights your face well enough and cancels out some of those shadows from the overhead and the side lighting, you're going to be better off. Now, with that in mind, I've seen some people saying, you know, that's a beautiful view out in my backyard. So I'm going to I'm going to set up in front of my sliding glass doors. And I'm going to face the camera and you're going to get a chance to look outside. And what that creates is a silhouette. You know, you're, you're just about all totally in the shadows because the camera is trying to show, uh, an even exposure. It takes all the brightness from the outside and all the darkness from the inside. It creates a balanced exposure between those two things and you end up being in the shadows. And you just don't want that. So do your best to control outside light. Generally, you want to turn off or shut blinds, turn off outside light, get rid of that so that you kind of really control the lighting in your environment. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is that audio is really critical. Um, you got to sound good. You don't have to buy an expensive mic. You don't even have to buy a USB mic, although you can. What I tell a lot of people is, there's a lavalier mic that you can buy. It's got a 20 foot cord. So it'll go from clipped onto your chest all the way over to wherever your camera is. It'll, it works with computers. It works with smartphones. And there are a couple, the easiest one to remember for me is the Movo. It's M O V O. And then the model number is L V one Movo L V one. You can get them for $20 on Amazon and they work with any device. Uh, the only catch is if you have a, a device like an iPhone smartphone, they don't have an audio jack. So you have to buy one of the little Apple adapters. You can get one for $9 at Target. You can get them at the Apple Store whenever the Apple Store is open, um, but you do need to have an audio jack on your device. Uh, most of the iPads do have an audio jack. Computers have an audio jack. So whatever device you're using, even a high-end camera, if you decide to do some video production, you can use the Movo LV1 with that. And it's going to make you sound much better. If you're just using the built-in mic that's in your webcam, the problem is that you're so far away from it. Even if it's just a few feet away, you're so far away from it, it makes your voice look sound rather makes your voice sound distant and echoey. And so that can be a little bit of a problem. Now there's more to what I would recommend to do on 
Zoom calls and on meeting calls, Skype and things like that. One more quick reminder, just go to youtube.com slash Larry Becker and you can find my video there. It's free and it's uh, about doing better on Zoom calls. There's also a new one that I put out after that that's about getting the right exposure with your webcam because sometimes webcams can make us look bad. And then the last tip that I'm going to leave you with is whatever your background is, keep it simple. If you have lots of objects, lots of things in the background, um, then it can be a little bit distracting. Have your background be simple so that people don't get distracted while you're talking by looking at all those things in your background. So that'll wrap it up for me this time. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and you can find out more about me and my videos and things like that. That stuff's all over at my website, Great On Camera. And I did that website because I wrote this book, Great On Camera, and that's out these days. That's all I got. What's next, Dave? Thank you. Uh, you told me about that microphone two years ago, I think. I've been telling people about it ever since, that, that Movo LV1, for sure. Yeah. I think uh, that's what uh, Yovi ordered and is on its way. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have no questions coming in. Uh, next up, we have Danielle, who's going to give us a an update on legislation and all the stuff that happened this week. Danielle, over to you. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm sure as most of you have heard, uh, the House passed a bill yesterday that provides $320 billion more for the PPP program specifically. So if you have already applied and you are in line with your financial institution, you should stay in that line. I'd also encourage you, depending on where you're at in that process, to look for an additional lender. Uh, I have applied myself through a very small bank. Uh, I think they're in New Jersey. I'd actually never heard of them before, uh, but I was able to get funds pretty quickly through them, which is the similar story being told by a lot of business owners who have used the smaller, more community-like banks. Um, so, I would actually recommend that you look at Lendio or at Cabbage with a K. Uh, if you are not able to get any assistance through them, I know they've been pushing applications through like crazy. If you use QuickBooks, they're off also offering to accept applications and submit them to various financial institutions for you. So those are some three pretty commercial like options that I've had a lot of reports of good things coming from those three places. Uh, QuickBooks is pretty new to the game, but they are pretty on top of it from what I've heard. So um, that's really my update. I do. Uh, I also want to mention quickly that if you have been getting the unable to determine payment status or eligibility message via the uh, get my payment tool on the IRS website regarding your stimulus check, you should check again today. A uh, number of people have reported to me that they were not able to enter any of that information yesterday for direct deposit information, but they were able to enter it as of this morning. So just a reminder, make sure that you are not on that website repeatedly throughout the day. The IRS is only updating it once overnight. So trying 27 times throughout the day is not going to get you any sort of different result. So I would encourage you to not participate in clogging up the traffic on that site any more than it needs to be. Um, so if you, uh, if you need any additional information on that or you want me to help you walk through the process, with either the stimulus check or the additions with the new PPP funds, definitely get in touch with me. You can schedule an appointment with me on my uh, on my website at drydentaxres.com, or you can find me on Facebook at Dryden Tax Res. All my information is there, and you can send me a message that way as well. So happy to take any questions if there are any. Yes, we have one question, uh, and this is Darren, too. He, you're welcome to step in here, Darren, and ask the question yourself or do the dialogue. Uh, when should funds be available? And if we apply for PPP, should we apply anywhere else? So funds for PPP, unfortunately, I don't know the answer, but I know that once your application has been reviewed, that uh, people are receiving funds within a week. 
So not from the time they applied, but from the time that they've received notice that their application has been reviewed by the lender and has been submitted to the SBA. Uh, that was my personal experience. I, I was one of the lucky ones and I was able to get funding pretty quickly. Uh, and that was my experience and that's consistent with most of the other business owners that have received funding as well. Um, if you applied for PPP, should you apply somewhere else? It, it's up to you. I know that a number of the banks have been continuing to process applications that they hadn't already reviewed. And once the SBA opens up the application process again, uh, then I imagine there will be a flood of applications coming through for approval. So I would definitely not withdraw any applications you've submitted. But if you are able to submit additional applications, I would recommend that you strongly consider doing so. Will the money from big corporations that has been returned be redistributed? I should hope so, but there isn't any information about that just yet, David. Uh, I would imagine that that money will go back in the pool. I know Ruth's Chris, as well as Shake Shack, had major disbursements from the last round of PPP funding, and they have both, uh, regardless of your opinion on why, they have both started the process of returning that money. Uh, and also, Secretary of Treasury, uh, Mr. Mnuchin, has also very strongly recommended to publicly traded companies that they also return their funds as they have access to other uh, streams of capital that, that uh, small businesses need access to this PPP more than they do. So they need to give the money back and give that money to someone else. So yes, I imagine it will be redistributed. There's absolutely no information on that just yet. Thank you. Anything else? No, it looks like we have no other questions. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Uh, next, uh, we have, I think Yobi's going to give us a, a two minute tip as well as Darren and I've got one to finish us up and David might too. Yovi. I, I can go. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning again. Um, this morning, I actually wanted to share some information regarding an article that came in the Florida Realtors Magazine that talks about whether landlords should disclose COVID-19 of uh, status uh, of that to start building owners and homeowners associations or C, uh, HOAs are not legally required to disclose if a tenant tests positive for COVID-19. According to the article, many landlords are reportedly ten telling tenants when a case of COVID-19 surfaces uh, in their buildings, even though they're not required to do so. Uh, some are sending emails or memos to tenants to let them know when one of their neighbors ha has contracted a virus so they can take extra precautions. However, real estate attorneys are cautioning, um, are warning property manage managers and HOA not to disclose who contracted um, the information, the, the virus, or in which floor they live in. Um, in addition, the tenants cannot be evicted because they, they are sick. Um, the Federal Fair Housing Act prohibits inquiries into the tenant, um, well, into whether a tenant has a, a disability and the nature of or extent of their disabilities. And that will include questions about medical conditions. Um, some property managers are unsure of how, how, about how much information they should revere, particularly if they have elderly or vulnerable people in their buildings, because disclosing against the wishes of the infected could potentially expose them to a lawsuit. But on the other hand, buildings that fail to disclose an infected person lives there could also be a, a risk of a lawsuit. Under the Fair, Fair, under the Fair Housing Act, People who currently have COVID-19, those who have a history of having the virus, and those who are perceived as having the virus may be protected against housing discrimination under the Fair Housing Act and other civil rights laws. One of the primary purposes of this is to protect individuals with disabilities from discrimination based on prejudice, stereotype, and unfounded fears. In addition, family members who live with or and with people who care for those who have COVID-19 are protected by these same laws. 
The law covers discrimination that may occur in apartment buildings, condominiums, nursing homes, um, homeless shelters, transitional housing, and any, any other kind of housing. Um, it also covers uh, types of housing transactions like lending and home appraisals. Um, in addition, the stereotype assumption that people from Asia or China or elsewhere are responsible for COVID-19 constitute uh, an evidence of national origin discrimination under the Act when associated with housing and lending-related transactions. Legally, tenants are, do not have to let anybody know about their health condition and whether or not they have COVID-19. Ethically, some are arguing that they should do so managers and tenants can take more proactive measures. In the end, there is no legal playbook in any of this. We are still in a gray area. Thank you. Thanks so much. Next up, uh, Darren, do you have something? Absolutely, Dave. Okay, very so good. For you. today, what I, I want you to think about a little bit is how we reopen or start to build back your business. It's going to be in stages, no matter what type of industry you're in. And how I want you to think about this is through your guest perspective. When we went through the recession 10 years ago, one major thing that came out of it was value. We understood that how we looked at money was going to be a little bit different from the experience we just went through. So we came out of that willing to spend our money, but making sure that the value was still there. Right now, a lot of places are probably getting a pass from some of the value that you're providing to your guests. I'm looking at this in, in three different aspects of how your guest looks at you. It's through the service, it's through your product, and it's through your marketing. And currently, we're okay if the service isn't perfect because we understand things are different and you might not have as many employees at a restaurant that you normally would. We understand the product challenges also because your distribution routes have been disrupted. I ordered from a, a local restaurant the other night for a celebratory dinner with me and my wife and my entree, which was shrimp, wasn't in the box. I was okay with that. I know the restaurant. I know that they're trying hard. I, I know that it's a different environment but how long are your guests going to be willing to give you a pass? So you have to be thinking about what type of service you're going to provide. And it's going to be different. Restaurants are going to have a, a lot of stipulations and the personal connection is going to be a lot tougher to express. So think about the type of service that you're going to have. I hope that everybody has been taking a good look at their business for the past six weeks and saying, how do we come back with a, a stronger product? What are we trying to do as our business? How can we improve? Personally, what we've been doing at Service with Style, we're ready to launch what we call Surveys Plus, and it's a, a great way to survey a lot of different people. So we've been engaging in a lot of surveys, and we're getting a lot of results back on what people are going to be looking for for the product, the service, and the marketing. If anybody would like a absolute free survey, if you want to survey your staff, your managers, your customers, just email me. I'll let you use it for free, no obligation, just to be able to get some of that great feedback right now so you can understand what the people that you do business with are going to want from you when we come out of this. And the last piece is marketing, because that's one of your biggest ways to get your brand name and your, your image out to us. So be cautious with the marketing. Be prepared for the marketing when you're absolutely ready and the confidence is back and you can launch. We're reopen. We're excited. But for right now, please be very, very careful. Keep your marketing simple and direct, um, information-based, uh, no big bells and whistles. Keep, keep it simple, but stay connected with your customer, your guest, as much as you can. And Dave, back to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, and ne next up, uh, David's going to give us a tip on using Wi-Fi versus Ethernet. All right. So um, it was a great presentation by Larry. And I'll, I'll add one quick thing is that it's much more secure if you're actually wired in when you're doing your online meetings. Uh, having video and audio transmitting 
uh, through your uh, internet, your network is actually, it can get very, um, you know, high bandwidth. So having, uh, it actually, instead of using Wi-Fi, instead of having, you know, having an ethernet connection to your device, you're gonna get much more reliable internet connection and less buffering. So, uh, you know, those cut ins and cut outs and stuff like that, drop packets, all that, that, that cause you to sound like you're talking underwater or to have you lose your video feed, uh, that should go away. Uh, so if, if you have the option, Yes, Wi-Fi is great. Wi-Fi is very convenient. You can go around and you know connect anywhere. But uh, if you have an option when you're doing something like video uh, editing or video um, transmitting, then you're probably going to want to go with an Ethernet connection. So that's all I have for today. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to finish up. Uh, first off, I just want to finish with a big thank you to everybody. And if you look down there, those are all the names, uh, all of our panelists. Um, we've done now our fourth, <clears throat> excuse me, our fourth Brandon Lunch Bunch. We've kept them tight. We've kept them to information that's good info without a lot of blabbery that's between. So if someone watches the video, we get 30 minutes of good info put out and some good clips we can take out as individual uh uh, short videos. So thank you to all the panelists who have offered great info and have just kept to info without being uh, running too long. Thank you to everybody. I do want to finish up uh, with one, my one tip. I've been working at home for 20 years and sometimes you get too dragged into the computer, too dragged into the screen. And of course, some people today are, are overrun with more to do between, who, who don't even have time to watch this, who with kids and work and a spouse who's off working at the hospital and all the stuff to do. So sometimes when you're working at home, you can work too much and you get pulled into the screen too much. Uh, I have a tip I've been using for 20 years even more when I, you know, back when it was just television that I'd be watching to turn off a little bit. And, and you don't have to change your behavior at all. You can do the exact same thing you were doing just seconds earlier. So when you're watching the screen or a tablet or a TV, you can do the same thing, but here's what you do. Just turn it off and spend two minutes looking at a blank screen. It's just two minutes. And then for those two minutes, you no longer have these distractions beaming back at you. And what I find when I just stare at a blank screen for a minute or two, I end up thinking about other things, cleaning the garage, calling somebody, I have to take a nap, I feel tired or anything like that. So in those moments where you feel like you're just being overwhelmed or too much screen time, try that. Turn, turn the uh, monitor off or turn the screen off and do the exact same thing. Just stare at the black screen and let your mind go empty for a little bit. Of course, you'll think about other things, but that's okay. You're just taking a short break so you have time to think about those other things or to relax for a second. And that's my tip. Give it a try. Uh, anybody who you know who doesn't have time to be watching these now, who's overwhelmed, share this tip with them. Uh, they can... Uh, try it just to get away from anything. Just stare at a blank, black screen. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. Our next uh, Brandon Lunch Bunch, next week we go to one a week. And we're gonna, the next one's going to be Thursday, April 30th at 11 a.m. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you then. <laughs>